again. It's good to have you back with us. Good morning and welcome to All Face Unitarian Congregation. I see some new faces out there today and we're real happy to have you with her, or should I say half faces, everyone wearing masks. Uh, today we're celebrating Earth Day 2021. And I have happy memories of being on the committee that founded the first Earth Day at the University of Minnesota in 1970. I invited Paul Ehrlich, the author of The Population Bomb, to be our speaker. And that was the hottest book of the time on the environment and was really the inspiration for Earth Day. And little did we know that 51 years later, we would be celebrating Earth Day all around the world. But there's sure a lot still to be done. Uh, there was a lot of momentum to begin with, and then it kind of fell away. And we really need to take this seriously. My name is Joyce Rame, and I will be leading our service today. Here you will find a diverse and inclusive spiritual community where we welcome people with many beliefs. You can bring your whole self your full identity, your questioning mind, and your expansive heart. At All Face, we have more than one way of experiencing the world and understanding the sacred. No matter who you are, wherever you are on your spiritual journey, and no matter whom you love, you are truly welcome here. We have a few announcements today. Monday at 7 p.m. on Zoom, we're going to have the Odyssey of our great lady, Annalie Hudanik, and I hope you can join that. It's going to be a very exciting, interesting uh, evening. Wednesday at 10 o'clock, we're having our 10 o'clock Scholar Adult Education session. Thursday at 11.30 a.m., we have coffee chat with the minister and Regina, our staff. And at 7 p.m. on Thursday, the youth will have their weekly Zoom meeting with Chantel Rhodes. Uh, an important thing to put on your calendar is that on April 26, at 7 p.m., we're going to have the Life Nehemiah Action on Zoom. Regina will be sending out the Zoom link again, and we're going to be, hopefully, get 1,200 people from all the congregations that belong to Leader Faith for Empowerment, and local officials will be meeting with us to hear about our hopes for affordable housing and better policing for people with mental health issues, so please do put that on your calendar. Our music today, is provided by Joan Marshall. Uh, she's a wonderful Broadway singer and, and she entertains us often. And she particularly is singing today because she is the chair of our climate action team and she has organized our program for today. And of course, Dan Tudor is back with us and Dan was our former music director and uh, he is a composer and accompanists and pianists of great skills and talents, and he always brings joy with him. So Dan, we're happy to have you back with us. Our guest speaker today is very special. We're happy to have Holly Rowan with us. She's a registered nurse, a retired midwife, public health nurse, and a seasoned social justice and environmental activist. She is a Calusa Waterkeeper Ranger and serves as public health advocate around local water issues, presently regarding Billy's Creek and our impaired waterways in Lee County. She is a co-founder of the Pachamama Alliance of Southwest Florida, as well as Southwest Florida Reset. Holly's activism has included organizing and participating in movements for peace, climate change, the environment, and for reproductive and LGBTQ rights. She served on the board of directors of EPAC, the Environmental and Peace Education Center, 
in Fort Myers for five years, and she served on the Happahatchee Center Incorporated Board. Holly is an active member of our sister congregation, the United Universalist Congregation of Fort Myers, and there she enjoys singing in the choir and serving as worship associate for their Sunday services, as well as coordinating their pastoral care team. So that all sounds pretty familiar. Uh, and now I'd like to invite you at home to sing together our hymn 361, Enter, Rejoice, and Come In, and Joan will sing for us here. They have shared some news with us. Jim Kersey's brother-in-law died. We hold him and his family in our thoughts and prayers. Jennifer McDagle lost a very good friend, and we hold her in our hearts and thoughts and prayers. Julie Simmons' father was hospitalized, and we hope that he will heal quickly. Jeannie Uzel fell and broke uh, her leg underneath where she'd had a knee replacement. She had surgery, 
The surgery went well, and it, she is expecting to go into rehab sometime this week. Carol Elrod shared the good news that she broke both of her wrists and had to have surgery, and she's been uh, in rehab, but she was able to actually type an email this week. So she's making progress, and, and she's looking forward to the time she can get home with Ed again. Uh, also, I'd like to remember Prince Philip, particularly because Prince Philip was a great environmentalist. I had the pleasure of meeting and talking with Prince Philip in 1994 when he came to Pakistan. He was the president of the World Wildlife Fund and he was promoting conservation. He planted a tree in Lahore and my husband and I had dinner with him and we had about uh, half an hour of, of talking, just the three of us about the environment. And that was at a time when other people weren't really talking that much about it. So we are really indebted to him for all that he has done through the many years to promote environmental justice. And now I invite you to reach out to all the people who are home alone, who can't get out, people who are suffering, and do what we can to include them. These, this has been a very difficult year. Somehow at all face, we've stayed connected, and it has meant a lot to so many people. I get many, many messages of appreciation. And we care for all of you who have joys and sorrows in your hearts. Now I'd like to ask everyone to close your eyes, take a deep breath, and let us turn our minds and hearts to today's service and contemplate our blessings. words of the very lawless. When the animals come to us asking for our help, will we know what they are saying? When the plants speak to us in their delicate, beautiful language, will we be able to answer them? When the planet herself sings to us in our dreams, will we be able to wake ourselves and act? And now we will have our prelude, Love You and What a Wonderful World with Dan Tudor and Joan Marshall.
you so much. Our reading today is Remember by Joy Harjo. Remember the sky that you were born under. Know each of the stars' stories. Remember the moon. Know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn. That is the strongest point of time. And remember sundown and the giving away tonight. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. And remember your father, he is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are. Red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth. We are earth. Remember the plants, trees, and animal life who all have their tribes, their families, and their histories too. Talk to them. Listen to them. They are living poems. Remember the wind. Remember her voice. She knows the origins of the universe. Remember that you are all people and all people are you. Remember, you are this universe and this universe is you. Remember, all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember, language comes from this. Remember the dance that language is, that life is. Remember. And now let us join in singing hymn number 203, All Creatures of the Earth and Sky.
Can you hear me? Awesome. Let's get a little situated here. So good morning, my friends, my Unitarian friends. I feel so deeply honored to be invited to speak with you for this very special Earth Day service today. I want to open with a land acknowledgement in the spirit of reconciliation to the original nations that were here in this place long, long before us. I honor the ancient Calusa tribes that lived, thrived, fished, and hunted these waters and lands that we now occupy. I also honor the Miccosukee and the Seminole tribes, the true caretakers of the Everglades and Big Cypress now. Let us look to indigenous wisdom that is now being made so much more available to us all on how to become better allies to them and how to transform ourselves to become better earth stewards. I must admit, I feel very at home here in this sanctuary, and to be able to stand here vaccinated without my mask on is a great joy to me. It's truly exciting. This is the first time I've been in a church or a sanctuary in well over a year. So we're making progress with this pandemic, but we must not let our guard down. Many of you know me already since I've been a member of the All Face Climate Action Team for a number of years now, as well as an occasional visitor to your Sunday services. This week, we're being called to recognize how deeply our relationship with Earth and our work for environmental justice is intertwined with all of our spiritual and religious traditions and beliefs. This is a day to be in wonder, to rediscover nature and our own place in nature, the interconnected web of life. Today, we join together to celebrate our Mother Earth and also to hold our hope and appreciation together for the pain and our sorrow in that celebration. Yes, the pain. Our planet is crying out to us for sure. Earth Day, as Joyce already said, was first celebrated on April 22nd, 1970, the year I graduated from high school. It was a day to honor Earth and to participate in environmental teach-ins around the country. I remember back then, we were really worried about pollution, we were worried about nuclear energy and overpopulation. As Joyce said, we did not yet talk about global warming greenhouse gases, or climate change. Little did we know then how quickly the impacts of our extraction economies were bringing us to the brink of climate collapse and mass extinction. Since then, the environmental movement has grown in this country and globally, and environmental awareness does permeate much more of our collective consciousness than it did before. Unitarian Universalism's seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are part, is so fitting for today and every day. Problems with consumption and environmental degradation have also grown with the world's economy and population. Our system of public safeguards does not protect everyone equally. Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and other people of color, as well as low income and rural communities, too often experience disproportionate environmental health disparities. This is a big transformation that needs to happen now. A transformation, a change from extraction to one of regeneration and resilience. So Earth Day now is also a day to feel our sorrow and let that sorrow motivate us. Sorrow for over 500 manatees 
this year have died because of such poor water quality. Our local waterways remain highly impaired. Billy's Creek, Manuel's Branch, the Estero River, the Imperial River, and man-made ecological disasters like Piney Point. We are in crisis, my friends. This is for sure. Well, as the ancient Chinese oracle, the I Ching says, crisis equals opportunity. We are at a critical turning point. Let us each ask ourselves this morning, what is the part that each one of us are being called to do now? I do believe that we can transform ourselves and support others to be better earth stewards. Let us look more closely at embracing eco-spirituality on a deeper level. I believe it starts by being in nature ourselves. When our activism is grounded in nature, we become more centered and more loving advocates for justice and for healing. So many people are suffering from what I call nature deficit disorder. And that separation from nature is another form of othering that we need to heal. My own spiritual path, which Joyce pretty much described, um, is deeply rooted in the call to work for peace and justice and in the practice of nonviolence. I was originally trained by the Quakers long ago in the 70s in nonviolent direct action. And the older I get, that call is grounded more and more in my love of earth and my commitment to work for clean water. When I moved to Florida in 2003, I met anti-war activists. And I was looking for a small tribe that I could be a part of. And I found them. Any of you remember EPEC? Yeah. I fell in love with Florida's precious ecosystems, the springs, the migrating birds, the gumbo limbo, the cypress, the salt palmetto, the beautiful live oaks, and the various palm trees. I fell deeply in love with the Everglades. I felt a sense of place there that I never even had when I lived in California in all of our beautiful rivers and lakes. When I first moved here, I loved swimming and just floating in the Gulf of Mexico. But you know what? It's been seven years since I floated in that Gulf because I'm afraid to go in that water for the possible risk to my own health. How sad is that? Long after, not long after moving here, I met Ellen Peterson. Some of you in this room might have known Ellen. She was members of both of our congregations. And Ellen was a force of nature herself. And she mentored me about the environmental issues that we were facing in Southwest Florida and ways to engage in grassroots activism here. One thing led to another. I co-founded the Southwest Florida Pachamama Alliance community. And shortly after, we Pachamama people introduced Southwest Florida to Project Drawdown. I want to show you my Bible. It's put together by a genius named Paul Hawken. Yes, this became my Bible. We even brought Paul Hawken down here to talk to us at FGCU about three years ago, and he spoke at the Collaboratory downtown as well, and he signed my book. So what is Drawdown? For those of you that don't know, Drawdown is a point in future when the levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere stop climbing and start a steady decline, thereby stopping catastrophic climate change as quickly, safely, and as equitably as possible. Well, yesterday I just opened up the book like some people do with their Bible, you know, and they ask a question. So I opened this book up and said, what drawdown solution do we really need to pay attention to right now? What should I mention? And they open up to this page here. Have it marked. Nutrient management. And the picture here 
is of a blue-green algae bloom flowing from a river in Sweden out into the Baltic Sea. Blue-green algae. So nutrient, fertilizers. That's how Piney Point happened, by fertilizer production. Wow. So let me let you know just a few drawdown solutions to climate change. They might surprise you if you haven't heard them. The one that I've chosen for myself, which I'll speak about a little bit more, is protecting our coastal wetlands. Nutrient management, the one I just showed you. Food composting. Reducing food waste. My partner and I have zero food waste this year by consciously shopping for our food, eating our leftovers, and composting. Regenerative agriculture, which is a true answer here in Southwest Florida to our water problems. Household recycling, stopping consumption of plastic, educating girls and women, family planning, eating a plant-based diet. These are just a few solutions. We need to do all of them, but it's really hard to do them all. Drawdown transformed my life, and it gave me hope. And once I became a trained drawdown convener and I offered a five-week intensive study of these 100 ways to reverse global warming, I became more focused in my own environmental activism. I chose one drawdown solution for me to focus on, and that was restoring our coastal wetlands. Well, about 25 other people also got really committed to work on at least one solution, and some of us, including the legendary Bill Hammond, formed a climate action fund through the Southwest Florida Community Foundation to provide funding for drawdown solution projects in Southwest Florida. After that five-week intensive, I realized that I needed to deepen that drawdown commitment I made to protect our coastal wetlands. I was already part of a growing interfaith sacred water ceremony movement to bring together people of many faiths and to pray over the water. We did it with song, we did it with ritual, we did it with water. So, um, I did some of those ceremonies along with my friend Betty Osceola of the Miccosukee tribe, but I needed to do more hands-on work as well. So three years ago, I joined the Calusa Waterkeeper organization here in Fort Myers, and I got trained as a waterkeeper ranger, part of a great team of citizen scientists committing to being the eyes and the ears on our waterways, as well as water quality testers for our watershed, by um, all the way from Lake Okeechobee down to the Gulf and Estero Bay. Because I am a retired community health nurse, I've kept my RN license active so that I could be a more credible spokesperson in Lee County when advocating for clean water as a public health issue. Well, then another convergence happened almost two years ago with the formation of the Southwest Florida Reset Center, which is now a 501c3 located on the UUCF campus. We made regenerative agriculture and the rights of nature movement two of our main objectives. We are also collaborating with FGCU to create food forests and permaculture demonstrations, not only on our Echo Preserve there at UUCFM, but in all of our neighborhood community centers, and to link them up for fair food equity and exchange and education about growing and preparing healthy foods. So I share much hope because we've been invited into a new beloved community of evolutionary activism. And we have such brilliant tools and movements available to us. I'll mention just a few of these grassroots organizations that have taken off in just the last few years. The Rights of Nature movement is so powerful. And you can learn about it more by Googling, by Googling, <laughs> I love that, by Googling FRON, F-R-O-N-N, the Florida Rights of Nature Network, and Lee Rights of Nature Network online. Their first success in Florida 
was really groundbreaking and is opening up the door. There was legislation that was recently passed in Orange County guaranteeing the right for all people to have clean drinking water. And in the whereas parts of that legislation, rights are actually given to the rivers and bodies of water. And that's the next step for the Rights of Nature movement. Instead of granting personhood to corporations, let us give our rivers, our lakes, and our forests rights. It's happening in some other countries around the world, like New Zealand and Ecuador. Growing Climate Solutions. Probably some of you here have heard about Growing Climate Solutions. They provide training for climate ambassadors as well as working for systemic change and policies that will address the climate crisis in our bioregion. And here's some really great news. The Lee County Board of uh, County Commissioners recently signed on to the Southwest Florida Resiliency Compact. And I believe this congregation has made a similar commitment to this compact. So let's not only hold ourselves in covenant to that compact to work to address climate change in our environment, let's keep the pressure on our county and also our municipalities to honor these commitments to work together for our bioregion. I've already mentioned the Southwest Florida Pachamama Alliance. Citizens Climate Lobby um, had a chapter form here because of our drawdown work. The Elders Climate Action Network, Calusa Waterkeeper, and Climate Reality are all coming together now. And I give Joan Marshall a lot of credit for that with the Climate Action Team. And internationally, of course, we've heard the voice of Greta Thunberg and also the Laudato Si tells us that it is our responsibility to care for creation. I mentioned my friend Betty Osceola. She's been emerging as a spiritual as well as a political leader and an indigenous grandmother speaking out for the water in the Everglades. Presently, she's raising awareness about 404 permitting for coastal wetlands that needs to be given back to our EPA. As soon as that permitting was handed to the Florida DEP, two weeks before number 45 last office, Burnett Oil got their permit signed and are preparing to drill in Big Cypress Preserve, home of the Miccosukee tribe. Betty has been leading prayer walks in Big Cypress and around Lake Okeechobee, which raised consciousness and awareness about healing and protecting our relationship with water, restoring the Everglades, and stopping big oil and development. I love this example of prayer, of walking in silence and listening to nature that leads into taking action to change policy. Check out the hashtag Defend the Sacred on Facebook and see what you find there. We all know we need to move away from fossil fuels, from mining, from chemical fertilizers and pesticides. We need to move away from colonization. We start by decolonizing our own minds. The resistance to these changes comes from fears of scarcity, from greed, and the systems of patriarchy that must fall, and I believe they are taking their last desperate gasps. So what would a successful exit plan from this extraction economy look like? Have any of you heard about Just Transitions? Anybody here? It's worth Googling too. Here's one definition. A just Transition is a vision-led, unified, place-based set of principles, processes, and practices that build economic and political power to shift from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy. Economy. Just transition towards low carbon and climate resistant development create opportunities for environmental sustainability, social equity, and economic prosperity. It means inviting everyone to the table in our own bioregion. And I'm committed to help doing that. I want to mention before I close the Unitarian Universalist Ministry for Earth. Their vision is a world in which reverence, gratitude, and care for the living earth 
are central to the lives of all people. Their purpose is to inspire, facilitate, and support personal, congregational, and denominational practices that honor and sustain the earth and all beings. They affirm and promote the seven principles of the Unitarian Universalist Association, including the one I've mentioned, respect for the inner independent web of all existence of which we are a part. Last week, Jill Marshall, Amy Clifton from the UU Congregation of Greater Naples and I, we got together on a Zoom and we agreed to co-create an echo challenge team among members of our three congregations to answer the UU Ministry for Earth's call for UUs to commit to work on drawdown solutions and to track them online. I heard you're about to do some workshops on drawdown. So that's pretty exciting. You all have hopefully heard about this in the last week. And if not, Joan and I will let you know really soon more how to get involved in this. It's really fun. And we get to be part of GA if we do it. I think Joan is planning to sing a song for the General <laughs> Assembly. So, I guess that's all I'm going to say about that. Pages. So what if we started each day by honoring Earth, by thanking the elements, water, fire, air, and Earth? When you get up in the morning and you turn on the tap, what if you said thank you to the water? Go outside and say hello to the sun out loud. Take a deep breath of fresh air, and as you exhale, let it be a breath of gratitude that feeds the trees. Stand on the earth and feel your feet, if you are able, and maybe even stand there barefooted and breathe in that earth spirit. I found a quote yesterday that I really liked. I thought it was might be a little too woo-woo, but it isn't after everything I've heard here today already. <laughs> Um, this is a quote that, um, by a man named Jim Conroy, PhD, and he's part of a uh, daily Zoom that started with the pandemic called Humanity Rising. And here's what he says. Interspecies communication, healing trees, blessing the waters, and partnering with nature are necessary and easy goals. Choose a favorite tree to explore nurturing a deeper mutual partnership with. Learn how to listen, and also we can learn how to whisper, collaborate, and co-create with the trees and other nature beings by coming from their point of view. They are alive, they have consciousness, and they can be healed through direct engagement in consciousness. This leads to mutual healing. On Earth Day, we realize the other half of what's needed to restore a livable planet. Practical and large-scale actions are crucial, but we say that by having engagement in consciousness right in our own backyards, then nature beings can be healed, strengthened, and withstand climate extremes. There's a hope to start a positive feedback loop which might counteract the negative trends of climate change. So, let us all recommit ourselves today to come into a deeper covenant of stewardship and creation care. Let us come to know that a truly beloved community includes all our relations, the winged ones, the scaly ones, the four-legged, the creepy crawlers, the trees, the springs, the flowing rivers above and below the surface of the earth, and yes, we two-legged creatures. We are made for these times, don't you feel it? And if we listen deeply, we will hear that still small voice inside leading us to our next steps as awakened evolutionary agents of change. Find that voice in nature, and I will see you on the trail. Thank you so much. Blessed be. Thank you.
thank you, Holly, for that beautiful presentation. I hope that all of you will fall in love with nature as Holly has. And our theme for this month was transformation. So if you fall in love with nature, you will be transformed. And she is a beautiful example of that, and so is Joan and all of the others of you that are so actively engaged in, in trying to preserve our beautiful Mother Earth. This is a time when we have our offertory. If you would like to support our services and activities here, you can send your checks and or you can visit our website. And now, open your heart.
years ago, on a clear day, you can see forever. Yeah. 